Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the OnScript Podcast. This is Matt Lynch coming to you from Regent College in Vancouver. Thanks so much for tuning in. We have a republished episode here, an interview with Dr. Ian McFarland at Candler School of Theology, and it's about his book, The Word Made Flesh, A Theology of the Incarnation. We hope you enjoy it. And thanks so much to all of you who support us regularly. That really helps what we're doing here. You can go to onscript.study forward slash donate if you would like to give. Thanks again for listening. Welcome to the OnScript Podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hello, friends. Welcome to OnScript. This is Amy Brown Hughes, a co-host for the podcast with Matt Lynch, Matt Bates, Aaron Heim, Drew Johnson, and Chris Tilling. Today, I am honored to speak with Dr. Ian McFarlane. After four years as Regis Professor of Divinity at Cambridge, he's returned as the Robert W. Woodruff Professor of Theology at Emory University's Candler School of Theology. He is the author of the new book, The Word Made Flesh, A Theology of the Incarnation, published with Westminster John Knox Press in 2019. And my thanks to them for sending me a copy of this book. He's also published many other books, such as his 2014 book, From Nothing, A Theology of Creation. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to talk with Ian today. I'll just say I totally nerded out over this book. Don't we all wake up in the morning turning over in our minds how to process the language of Chalcedon? Of course you all do. I knew it. I'm among friends here at OnScript. Welcome, Ian. Thank you. Good to be here. Okay. Well, I just want to jump right in here. And we like to give our listeners an opportunity to get to know um, theologians um, that come on our podcast. So could you start, start us off by talking about how um, your journey in, the, in theology went? Like, what did that journey for you look like? What was your entry point or entry points, as it may be? And how do you understand theology now? Um, well, I started to become interested in theology when I was uh, an undergraduate, I guess. Um, I uh, was reading um, Bonhoeffer, and that got me into reading Luther and various other uh, uh, folk. Um, and uh, after um, I finished, uh, well, after undergraduate, I uh, attended seminary, um, intending to go into the parish, but uh, I found that I was really taken by theology as a discipline which I still conceive very much as for and of the church, but nevertheless um, in uh, the context of an academic setting. And um, I was lucky enough to get into a doctoral program and then lucky enough even more so to get a job afterwards. Um, <laughs> uh, and so that's how I, how I got here. I mean, I, again, as I indicated, I really do think of theology um, as pretty much the discipline that has to do with the church's reflection on whether or not what it ends up saying actually bears witness to the good news. So I think of it as very much an ecclesial uh, centered discipline and uh, that uh, in my own work, you know, one, one can see what I think I'm doing in many of my writing and certainly in this book is to look at uh, a doctrine that might appear to be not good news or at least not to be directly related to what Christians might uh, imagine to be good news, or which has been specifically charged with inhibiting that message and attempting to show how uh, it actually does a better job than has been suggested. So, <laughs> yeah, I you mentioned Bonhoeffer and Luther. Um, my entry point into theology was also Bonhoeffer. I think a lot of people have that story. I I, I read him my junior year of high school for the first time. And I know a lot of people read The Cost of Discipleship first, but for some reason I, I went after, um, I can't remember why, but his letters from prison. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and there was just something so captivating. I, I come from the Pentecostal charismatic tradition mm -hmm. and you're from the Lutheran tradition. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this, it was actually quite interesting that I ended up reading Bonhoeffer in a lot of ways. <laughs> Uh, but I, I, it's interesting to hear at different entry points for people how some of the same people tend to come up, which I think is a, a testimony mm -hmm. to, and Luther being another one, freedom of a Christian, or uh, these 
it's people that have lives that we connect with, right? Yeah. So it was I a cycle for me, I must admit. So I was very typical that way. But yeah, but I letters <laughs> and papers came pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to jump right into your book with now with a big question. Why a new book on the incarnation? Um, well, uh, as I've already alluded to a little bit, um, what I was interested in was, uh, well, let me make a two-stage answer to this. Um, in my previous, my immediately uh, previous piece of work, my book on creation, um, I made use of a lot of Christological background material, and it seemed like it, yeah, a next step would be to go into that in a little more detail. Uh, but then the particular problem I wanted to address was the critique, which has been made by theologians uh, going back to, uh, you know, the turn of the 19th century or before, that traditional Christian ways of talking about Jesus had ended up diminishing the significance of Jesus' humanity. Uh, and much modern Christology, in reaction to that, has been uh, uh, forms of rethinking uh, the doctrine of Christ's person that attempt to distance themselves from the Chalcedonian definition and address that claim in other ways. And uh, it seemed to me that uh, those alternatives actually had some significant problems with them, and that while the concern, uh, the original critique was fair enough in terms of the way in which Chalcedon had actually been appropriated uh, in uh, both Eastern and Western churches. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the doctrine actually had more robust resources to address that concern than modern attempts to reformulate it. Uh, those who took that route uh, might have believed. So that's, the, that's sort of the genesis of the, of the project. When I appreciated your book, well, as an early Christian theologian, just your work with the texts, um, and not just uh, texts from the tradition and the early tradition, but also moving into sort of Catholic, Reformed, Orthodox, like just a lot of a lot of work with these texts, where there's sort of a, a sense in which, um, like, really looking at the ad fontes, right? Like going back to these sources and saying what what resources maybe aren't we utilizing that are already there? And I really appreciated the attention to that in, in your book, which, as you say, was part of the point. Um, but it read as, I think sometimes when we think about, oh, we're going to read something about this council, it was in the fifth century. Like, it, but this was a real sort of beautiful um, way to uh, look at these these uh, discussions that were happening in this council in a way that allowed it to kind of shine through. <laughs> okay. um, it doesn't get lost in sort of this happened way back then with these philosophical guys and this stuff and all the things that we pile onto it. Mm -hmm. So I appreciated that. So your book is composed of three major sections the divide, the bridge, and the crossing. And you advocate a Chalcedonianism without reserve. Observing that it's typical for Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant traditions that adhere to the theology laid out at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 to affirm it, but then, as you say, not so much follow through on the implications, which has led to basically a weak uh, interpretation that has left some room and some questions, perhaps. So you point out that this is especially true with Jesus's humanity, as you've already mentioned. Would you lay out, maybe more specifically, where you see that lack of follow through and what the resulting implications are? Yeah, well, you see, I mean, you know, Schweitzer famously uh, critiques the tradition of lives of Jesus in the 19th century, but he's very appreciative of the fact that they actually brought Jesus, at least made an attempt to bring Jesus to life in light of uh, what he views as Chalcedonian uh, tradition to which they're reacting, where Jesus' divinity had swamped his humanity. And I, I quote uh, Catherine Keller much more recently, who makes a similar point. She has a wonderful uh, 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 image uh, she puts forward that what's happened in, um, in traditional Christology is that the doctrinal frame has overwhelmed the uh, the picture uh, of Jesus that is supposed to be in the center. Um, and I think uh, the reason that happened uh, was because beginning with the Tome of Leah, which is 
pre-Chalcedonian, but uh, becomes the major filter through which uh, Chalcedon is interpreted, particularly in the West. Um, there is this idea that I mean, Leo talks about um, uh, the humanity shining through in the sufferings and the divinity shining through in the miracles, more or less. And that suggests that the real, you know, so when you hear that, what do you think is important? Well, the miracle part, right? So, you're, you, so the, the things that become a theological interest are actually not those things that are, that are actually most distinctively human about Jesus. They're not, again, nobody denies Jesus' full humanity, all the rest of it, that's part of the, of the, uh, of the language. But uh, what is, but the humanity is in itself a point of revelation of God. The revelation of God comes as God supervenes on the humanity in some way, and the humanity is simply there as that which, as it were, you know, takes the punishment and you know, various forms of substitutionary ideas, but not that which is itself disclosive, except as sort of a, a shell through which, you know, the, you know, there's glowing coming out or you know, something of that sort. So I think that's, it's that way of parsing Chalcedon um, where uh, one doesn't actually attend to the humanity per se, but those parts of the, of the human that are superhuman, so to speak, uh, that actually is where one sees Jesus. And that seems, and that inevitably, I think, does lead the humanity to get ignored. And what you focus on are the parts that, uh, although mediated through Jesus' human life, nevertheless are understood to be not human, superhuman, uh, or, or what have you. And underneath that, too, there's this... I don't know if assumption might be too strong of a word, but of divinity as sort of fundamentally consumptive or coercive, that obviously divinity would just eat humanity for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, or, or even just, I mean, it needn't, I mean, it needn't be kind of like the, you know, uh, last temptation of Christ kind of, you know, clawing in the back of Jesus' brain. But there is, because I, I mean, one certainly does, I mean, one thing I want to point out is that if Jesus as human is, Spirit inspired, and that's the way in which, uh, for example, the miracles, in fact, can be understood. They are there is a divine kind of super. There is a divine supervention, but it's, uh, you know, a, a supervention that is, um, first of all, in, in that respect, not unique to Jesus. It's the way in which the Spirit inhabits every human being, and that's the way in which human being. That's that's part of what Jesus' humanity means. Um, and it's, uh, so, so I, don't, I, I don't necessarily, I mean, I think there are places, certainly in the tradition, where there is that sort of, you know, uh, 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 how should you put it, uh, well, consumptive, your language, mm -hmm. um, language can come up. Uh, but I think even where it doesn't, um, I mean, or even where it isn't that exaggerated, uh, it's, it's the idea that, um, you know, divinity is seen in some, in the shiny bits, or you know, in some ways in which right. uh, uh, human beings are not human. Whereas I think what one wants to say, I mean, what's what is uh, distinctive about the incarnation or, or as a doctrine is that it's precisely in the humanity that the uh, divinity is revealed. And although it, it 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 happens in Jesus in a particularly significant way, because in Him alone is the person identified with. God in a way that isn't the case with other persons. Nevertheless, the mechanisms of, of the display of divinity are much the same. That is, you know, miracles are done by Elisha, Elijah, by the apostles, and by Jesus. Uh, and the mechanism by which they're done, that is, by which human beings display the power of God in a way that is revelatory of God's uh, will for, for creaturely flourishing, you know, how that happens is the same in all cases. That is, the Spirit enables, empowers human beings to do that work. Um, but don't look, but in that sense, to look at the miracles as where Jesus' divinity shines through is a mistake. It's where Jesus, it's where the divine power certainly is visible in Jesus in that way, but not in a way that's fundamentally different than it is in uh, other human beings who uh, are graced to perform miracles. So in that sense, Leo's focus on that, on, you know, Jesus' miracle working is a mistake. Um, again, not because of any problem with miracles or miracles can't be verified or any of that stuff, simply because that isn't actually distinctive of Jesus. Jesus' right. miracle working is something that is broad-based, and of course Jesus himself famously says his followers will do greater miracles than he does. So that, that can't be a proper focus for Christological reflection if you're trying to determine what's distinctive about Jesus' 
vis-a-vis -vis other uh, human beings. Thank you for that. So in your first section, in which you explore the, the divide, right? When you, in which you explore the creator-creature distinction, you talk about how we talk about God. As many of us are used to hearing it taught or teaching it ourselves, especially some very classic like sort of theologians have written this way, the attributes of God. Instead of beginning with the classic incommunicable attributes or perfections, those descriptions of God that are not true of anything or anyone in creation, but are of God, or as we can describe God, you follow Karl Barth's privileging of the communicable or relatives. Would you, ta would you talk a little bit about why you took this particular approach? Yeah, you know, of course, part of what I do is to say that Bart actually doesn't do what he says he's going to do. Right. <laughs> uh, that although he, he says he's going to privilege uh, the communicable attributes, um, in the section before he actually goes in the attributes of love and the attributes of freedom, he actually emphasizes the saiety and freedom, and that actually becomes the dominant uh, to, uh, you know, motif in his uh, presentation. So, um, so in that sense, I'm I'm trying to do something I think is more consistent with uh, what Bart himself uh, said he was going to do. Um, and of course, uh, the other thing I do is when I get to the incommunicable ones, I don't prioritize freedom. Uh, in fact, I don't mention it at all. It becomes presence. But in terms of the ordering. Um, the ordering is, a, for me, and I think this is what Bart also thought, but it's a function of the way in which God's own intertrinitarian life um, is most fundamentally structured. And I think the, uh, the error with Bart is that Bart wanted to see freedom as somehow, um, well, I, mean, I think, first of all, it, it ties in with a, a certain kind of particularly modern uh, anxiety about uh, you know, individual autonomy and things like that that I'm not particularly sure are, are helpfully uh, projected back on God and lead to some of the common critiques one has of Bart, even by sympathetic critics, namely that he has a, there's a kind of authoritarian, even though notwithstanding Bart's anti-Nazi activities, there's a kind of authoritarianism in the way in which he conceives of God, although uh, the way he actually spells it out is, you know, has a much more friendly feel, but structurally there's that problem. So for me, uh, freedom, insofar as it's an issue that is non-compulsion or non-constraint, is actually intrinsic to the way one talks about love anyway, so that the kind of balancing that Bart wants to do, I think, misses the point. Now, in terms of why I begin with those attributes, again, they're, they're part of the intrinsic structure of the divine life. Fundamentally, the life is a life of love, and, I, you know, and I, the reason one uh, makes that conclusion is because the biblical narrative of God, and particularly uh, of Jesus' relationship with God, I think, puts that forward. So uh, it's an attempt to be faithful to what I take it to be, what would I see as the internal structure of the Trinity, which in turn is faithful to the biblical uh, exposition of God's identity and character. So that's the reason. Again, very similar in terms of the logic to Bart, but trying to do it in a way that I think is actually more, I hope, is more consistent with Bart's own insights than Bart's exposition was. Right. And, and I think there's this constant, it's hard to tell, like, like excusing Bart in his own context, right? Of like, <laughs> uh, but all of us in how we um, are describing God and, and the, the particular sort of things we want to emphasize, right? It's almost from a very personal space. We almost make God distant <laughs> um, because it feels a variety of reasons, right? We need a power that's bigger than the power that we're dealing with. Um, that is a, a, the wrong kind of power. We need something um, that helps answer questions when we have no questions. So we tend in our, in our desire to know God, almost in a sense, or to use, these, use the more, those attributes of, called incommunicable as a, as a way of um, almost making God safe in transcendence, to kind of freeze him in a, partic freeze him in a particular way that um, in, in some kind of roundabout, big, a roundabout way helps us feel like we're communing with God when God is actually <laughs> uh, yeah. revealing something quite different. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess there's, the, yeah, I don't like it. You can't make too much of a fetish of things. I mean, you can, I don't think there's any you know, great sin that would happen if you went the other way around, but every theology, you know, adopts its own rhetoric to attempt to make points and to guard against uh, 
tendencies that the theologian is worried about or the theologian sees elsewhere or imagine she or he sees elsewhere in the tradition. So, you know, how one does things is partly always an attempt to, uh, I think, implicitly correct uh, problems seen elsewhere, and that affects the way it happens. I, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, uh, I don't think it's intrinsically impossible that one could have, you know, like you could have reversed the two sections in my book, but yeah, I did it, and the reason I did, because again, I wanted to, to make a particular point about uh, how to follow through on what I took to be a good insight of Bart that Bart may not have followed through on as well as he thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, because I, I, I teach it the incommunicable way to start mm -hmm. with. I use a different, like a different list than some other people do. I, I just think it's interesting to see the different approaches people take. Yeah, and, and, of course, and yeah, and even which, you know, which attributes so you can right. which one, right. which one I chose to highlight or the ones I chose to highlight and choose other ones. Yeah, there are right. lots. And how, and how theology is sort of this large dialogue of all of us kind of having this conversation with these different contexts and these different emphases. Sure. Yep. So in your next chapter, you turn to creation. Specifically, creation from nothing, creatio ex nihilo, for you Latin nerds out there. I particularly appreciated your precision here because the concept takes a bit to sink in. Um, I want to read a section here to give everyone an idea of where you're going with this. It's not just precision for precision's sake. You say this. In short, the fact that creation from nothing means that behind created being there stands nothing but God does not imply any def defect or lack in created being for the power of divinity is such that creatures need nothing but God in order to be precisely because in creation from nothing, there is nothing but God that needs to be taken into account as the cause of created existence. The only possible threat to creatures being is God whose will is precisely that creatures should exist. The one possible threat thus turns out to be no threat at all, because as Paul once put it, if God is for us, who can be against us? Would you speak a bit more on God's relationship with creation? Yeah, well, um, well, first of all, I think that that's the one. The doctrine of creation is often in popular uh, discourse both inside and outside the church thought of as a, a historical claim um, uh, and fundamentally the logic of the doctrine I think is not that uh, the logic of the doctrine is about relationship uh, and what the doctrine of creation is teaching is not fundamentally you know that the world had a beginning although I think it did but that's I mean as Thomas Aquinas pointed out the doctrine of creation from nothing could be maintained even if one held to the eternity of the world, um, uh, as long as one understood that you know God is eternally the cause of it, right? Um, so what's important about creation is to, is to emphasize the fact that when one is thinking about the conditions of creaturely existence, the only precondition is God, not God plus anything else. Um, and that becomes, as uh, I was trying to indicate in the passage you read, good news, um, because it means that, uh, I mean, now again, let's back up a piece. Why is this important for Christians? Well, because if there were anything else in addition to God, that would constitute a possible limit on God's capacity to save, because then you'd have God plus something else, and there'd always be some question about whether in any individual case uh, God would be able to overcome whatever that something else is. If it's only God, then whatever, whatever one makes of sin and evil and the other things that seem to block our capacity to live the fullness of life God intends, fundamentally all those things are subject to God because fundamentally our existence is held in being and depends on God alone. Uh, so creation in that sense is fundamentally a piece of good news in the sense that to say that there's nothing other than God behind creation is to say that there's nothing that finally can defeat God's capacity to bring creation uh, to the end that God intends. Although, of course, how God can do that in light of the evil and sin and everything, we have no, we don't quite grasp yet, but we have that assurance so that we're able to trust God fully. So, um, so the, the character of God's relation to creation is fundamentally one of upholding. So, for example, even in, when we commit sin, 
uh, which is fundamentally going against God's will, and therefore fundamentally, insofar as God's will is precisely for our existence, undercutting in some fundamental sense the very basis for our existence. The fact that we are held in existence as sinners, um, that means, however one again interprets God's, uh, you know, the, the character and the outcome of God's wrath against sin, uh, the fact that we are held into existence as sinners means that even in God's opposition to sin, um, uh, God's resistance to it, you know, we are, or better put it this way, even in our resistance to God, God resists that resistance by holding us in being, notwithstanding our sinful state. Mm. So that the fundamental character of uh, our God's relationship to creation is, is one of upholding and affirming and uh, and upholding and affirming that uh, against which there is no other force that could uh, constitute a potential for defeat. Mm. Thank you for that. Uh, as we move into the second section where you turn toward Christ, the bridge, your section on nature and hypostasis afforded me an opportunity to slow down and process these familiar terms again for the first time. It's always fun to teach them because students are like, what is hypostasis? Can you translate that? I'm like, well, <laughs> let me talk around that uh, and, and, and explain why I kind of like the Greek here. I think our listeners might appreciate, as I would, uh, sort of a breakdown of these terms with regard to Christ. I think this is where like Trinitarian theology and such can get really like, like flying over people's heads. But what they mean and is pretty important and for understanding who Christ is. So if you could just spend a couple minutes talking about that, that might be very helpful for our listeners who maybe are like, oh, yeah, I remember that from my class I took way back then. <laughs> to bring yeah, so, back um, in mind. Fundamentally, uh, Chalcedonian Christology is known for, I mean, that the, the heart of the definition is that Christ is two natures, fully divine and fully human, uh, and one hypothesis, united in one hypothesis. Now, um, as, as you will know, and as I explained in the book, um, the definition of those terms, particularly hypothesis, was not exactly, I mean, really only becomes uh, clearly articulated in terms of in Christological Chalcedonian terms in the century or so after Chalcedon. Um, so what I'm what I'm about to say is not what I think anybody at Chalcedon necessarily would have said, but it's certainly the way in which it becomes, uh, uh, it crystallizes out in the uh, Second Council of Constantinople uh, in 553, and then the, the third in 681, and what used to be called Neo-Chalcedonianism, but just think of it as the Chalcedonian tradition as it, uh, as it emerges from subsequent debates. And that is that, um, to put it in fairly crude, but I think uh, helpful terms, nature refers to the what of something and hypothesis to the who, at least when talking about God, angels, and human beings. Um, and so what uh, the Chalcedonian definition, again, as it uh, becomes received in the tradition is saying, is that Christ... Uh, fully instantiates the divine nature, which of course, as the second person of the Trinity, he must, but somehow also uh, is able to fully instantiate a human nature. So Christ is at once fully human and fully divine, but there is only one who behind that. And so what that means is um, the phrases, word of God, son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, and son of Mary are all fully convertible terms. That is in any sentence, that begins, Jesus of Nazareth is, and fill in whatever the predicate is, you could substitute Son of God without any change in truth value, okay? That's the key point. So uh, what uh, Chalcedon is saying is that, I mean, fundamentally what it was trying to, to secure uh, is that uh, there aren't, there isn't a, on the one hand, there isn't a divine word that somehow is behind Jesus, so that you can't actually interchange those two, Jesus of Nazareth and Son of God, fully. Um, at the same time, neither does that coincidence of identity of who Jesus is, namely none other than the second person of Trinity, the Word of God, etc., um, diminish the integrity of either the divine or the human nature. So that's the, 
that's the point. And the way I talk about this, uh, what I've just set up till now is pretty much bog standard uh, uh, Christological uh, distinction, more or less. Um, what I attempt to do in the uh, book, and here I borrow uh, from my own teacher, Catherine Tanner, is to argue that the notion of, you know, that you could, one can conceive that notion of incarnation uh, in a way, fully divine and fully human, in ways that don't uh, involve any kind of mixture or melding or anything like that, by simply recognizing that what is, what happens in Jesus is that whereas it's always the case that with every creature, because of creation from nothing, God is the immediate source of that creature's being and action. In Jesus alone, God identifies that creature's being and action with God's own self. So, uh, as I say in the book, um, you know, when I put a cookie in my mouth, um, I can only do that because God is empowering me to put that cookie in my mouth, both my the physical elements that make that happen and my own will. Um, but uh, when Jesus puts a cookie in his mouth, that's also true. But in Jesus' case, and in Jesus' case alone, we can say that when Jesus puts a cookie in his mouth, we can say God puts a cookie in his mouth, which we wouldn't say with any other human being. So that's the function of nature and hypothesis there. That In Jesus, we see at one level a human being just like any other human being. You cut Jesus, he bleeds like anybody else, etc. Um, but while the what is indistinguishable from any other human individual, the who, in his case, in his case alone, is the second person of the Trinity. That's his hypothesis. That's his identity. Well, this, this is a nice segue into my next question. Uh, it's one of the things I appreciate about your work, which I kind of mentioned at the beginning, is how well you engage with traditions outside your own Lutheran tradition, especially Orthodox theology. In this section, you delve into the problem of whether it is possible or not for Jesus to reveal the divine nature as a human. So here's the question that will make all of our brains hurt, but we're all going to love it. Do we see the invisible God in Christ? If so, how? If not, what do we see? Yeah. And the answer is no, we don't. <laughs> um, and that's because the divine nature is inherently invisible. And again, I think that's the, one of the important corrections I want to make about, with the way in which Chalcedon often tends to get understood. Again, going back to Leo's, the divinity shines forth in the miracles. Um, uh, so, uh, I mean, one of the um, light motifs of my uh, of the book is I quote uh, a passage from a letter Luther wrote, where he says, "If one wants to talk about God accurately, one should look only at Jesus' humanity." Now that raises a problem, which is the basis for your question. If all you're seeing is Jesus' humanity, I might say that yes, the who of Jesus is divine, but if all I'm seeing is Jesus' human stuff. How do I translate that to knowledge of the divine nature? That is, if we, if we take, I mean, what I've done is to take very seriously Chalcedon's claim that the two natures are not confused or, or um, uh, conflated in any way. Um, how does that then allow us, in looking at Jesus, to make any connection between what we see in Jesus and the way God is? I mean, have, by, by emphasizing the distinction of the natures, uh, have I not um, uh, undermined the ability to say Jesus actually gives us knowledge of God if we don't see the invisible nature? And so what I try to argue is this. Um, the way we get around this is by saying, even though Jesus, like any creature, only shows us, can only sh all we can perceive is creaturely stuff, because that's all our senses are built to see, um, Jesus nevertheless exhibits certain characteristics, love, mercy, wisdom, so forth. Now, of course, other human beings exhibit those things too. We don't take other human beings as being um, uh, able to be indicative, teach us what God is like in the same way Jesus does. Uh, but And the reason for that, of course, is in the other human beings' case, there is this distinction between the identity of the human being and God, and of course, in traditional teaching, uh, there's the problem of sin. So when I look at another human being's activities, being myself a fallen human being, um, I can't really discern which of those things are reflective of divinity and which of those things are not. I'll, of course, have my prejudice about this. Some things will appeal to me. I'll say, yeah, that's divine-like stuff, and some things won't. But those judgments are fallible. Um, and they're fallible because the person I'm looking at is fallible. 
In the case of Jesus, insofar as one confesses he is none other than the Son of God, and therefore, since God cannot sin, without sin, Jesus' activities do become reliable analogs to the way in which God actually is. Uh, so although we do not see the divine nature in Jesus, we do see in Jesus the exhibition of those activities of God, love, mercy, wisdom, wrath, justice, all those things, in a way that allows us to say, uh, this becomes a proper guide to our talk about God. Now, even so, of course, um, because God's transcendent, when I speak of God as good or wise or just, uh, it isn't simply Jesus times 50 or whatever. I mean, it, there's always going to be a break between any creaturely manifestation of divine goodness and wisdom, and therefore my understanding of what divine goodness and wisdom really are prior to the eschaton. Nevertheless, insofar as one confesses Jesus as truly divine, Jesus' activities and tendencies become the reliable guides for Christian God talk, even though we don't actually see divinity, uh, that is the divine stuff, because the divine stuff is inherently invisible, we do see the divine activities mirrored in, a, uh, max, in, in the way it is maximally possible for creatures to do so in Jesus, insofar as Jesus is a creature whom God has identified with God's own life. Mm. I was thinking it, it, it raised me some of the conversations. I mentioned Orthodox theology because of the theology of icons, right? Mm -hmm. You don't paint, like iconography, you don't paint the divine, right? right? Um, so it's, it's a confession of humanity um, right. when we're talking about depiction of, of Christ, right? But humanity that is, part that is participating in the divine activities and right. in, a, in, a, in, 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 in some way. So that Jesus and then the saints, we're talking about icons, mm -hmm. in, you know, insofar as the saints are imitating Jesus, Jesus still becomes the criterion. But it's that, it, it's the idea that there are aspects of God's being that insofar as we're creatures, God gives us to share in. Um, again, because we are, insofar as we are sinful and creation has a fallen state, uh, our ability to gauge our talk about God to any non-Jesus creature is fraught. Um, right. Even with Jesus, it's fraught insofar as we can, you know, we can obviously always, uh, uh, you know, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, you enter the kingdom of heaven, but at least as a theological principle, insofar as Jesus is not burdened by sin, uh, in his case, when we see activities that we say, yeah, that looks divine-like activity to me. We can be confident that that's not simply our projection, that, that in fact, somehow or other, if we're attending to Jesus, uh, that is the proper place to attend to in order to get the kinds of well, verbal descriptors, but also modes of action and activity that are indicative of God's will for the world. And it made me think, too, I, you mentioned this earlier, too, about how really this what this conversation it, like some of the things you're trying to talk about actually were like later that Cal, um Calcedon actually sort of spun spun out later mm -hmm. and it makes me think a lot about how especially in the protestant frame if we talk about councils at all we tend to stop at 451 mm -hmm. and don't really go off into you know icons uh, like and we just sort of go oh that's not that's not us um but I, in my own teaching and and, and such I, i've just noticed how stopping there actually we run into some pretty significant difficulties in yeah. christology and it's not because oh i want them to know something that they don't know but the very questions that they're asking um the church has had these conversations about the humanity of, of christ and how these things how these things interact so um it's another thing i appreciated um uh about your book bringing those conversations in as as like normal and not sort of oh, these later things that these people only talk about. So let's move to the last section of your book. So there's a particular point that you return to several times in your third and final section, The Crossing, that the resurrection or the ascension, the parousia are, quote, further episodes in Jesus' life, right? Uh, you work to distinguish these as non-spatiotemporal events that don't just automatically follow in temporal succession after Good Friday. Like, well, then it's the resurrection, then it's the ascension, then it's the second coming. I have a note in this section, like I wrote it out to the side, that just says time, dot, 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 my brain hurts. Would you outline your concern here 
and help us not to fall into the issues that result from not attending to this point. Yeah, so yeah. So again, the, the, the claim is that, uh, well, basically my claim is Jesus' story ends on Good Friday. And then what one has in resurrection, ascension, and parousia are all our three different, as it were, aspects of the vindication of that life, but not further episodes in that life. Although, because of difficulties in how you talk about these things, they end up looking like narrative sequence. Why do you not want to make them narrative sequence? Why do I want to insist on the fact that Jesus' life is bounded by Christmas and Good Friday? Because that is, because Jesus' life is precisely the communication of God's identity for us. If it's open-ended, which is what you're saying, if you say that, well, yeah, that after, after Jesus dies, it's kind of like, he, you, know, there's, you know, there's sort of a, a, you know, we simply go up a step, but there's simply more, more sequence of events, more time. Then we're saying that Jesus' identity is, in fact, open-ended. And if his identity is open-ended, then we can't be positive that maybe part of what we're going to see is that Jesus isn't so gracious or kind or willing to see us saved after all. Okay, So the definitiveness and finality of Jesus, I'm arguing, requires that we see his life as any human life bounded by birth and death. And what we have in resurrection and ascension and parousia are, again, dimensions of that the vindication of that life as precisely God's life, and thus the revelation of God's uh, will for us. Um, uh, so we have, you know, so resurrection is the fact that God, not far from allowing that life to die, is, uh, you know, is, declares that life is in fact upheld as uh, that of the Son of God. Ascension is talking about the fact that that, you know, that identification means that Jesus is at God's right hand. That is, Jesus is, stands in for God, that God's God's power is nothing else but Jesus' power, and parousia simply refers to the fact that at some point that fact will be publicly revealed to the whole world. Um, but it's not, you know, Jesus. Jesus isn't sitting in heaven tapping his foot waiting for the parousia. I mean, there's going to be. I think probably one thing. One, one, one thing I want to emphasize in the book, both before and afterwards, is don't think of. Jesus having a career that begins at some infinite point in the past and goes some infinite point in the future and sort of ticks along, and then he comes down and up. In other words, time really only refers to the this worldly element of the word's existence. When you're talking before or after, although we can't help but do that because we're in time and our conceptual apparatus is linked to it, there's a fundamental category mistake there. Uh, you know, Jesus isn't living before, there is no... You can't talk about the word existing, uh, you know, Prior. or living before the incarnation or after the resurrection, because that's assuming that there's that there's temporal extension uh, in you know in God's life, which I don't think there is. Um, and again, I think there's in addition to the fact I think there's a, that's a problem with how you think about God. It also is a problem for the coherence of one's claim of the finality of Jesus as the unsurpassable revelation of who God is. So right. The open-endedness being, yeah, yeah. Uh, open-endedness would 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 call into question whether or not Jesus is actually what some person we want to trust or not. Right. Um, what makes it definitive is that we see that the one who is Lord is the one who identifies with the human condition even unto death, and all that happens after that is the crucified one. That one who did that is defined as the one who is who is none other who rebe- who is who is the the being of God's own self. And there's no more to be said than that. All that's going to be said is, 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 is the, as it were, uh, playing out the implications of that reality. Like I said, time, my brain hurts. But it, it, was, it was a really, it was a particularly important section for me because even as I write about these things and, and think about these things or teach these things especially, I think that's where it gets really um, and in, in every sermon, right, we're about to enter the Lenten season and go into, you know, listening to Eastern sermons and such, and just the difficulty that we have of communicating this, um, and how when we, when we sort of let go of some of these precision uh, pieces, how we, we can undercut everything we're trying to communicate, <laughs> which isn't meant to be like to scare people into or anything but at the same time it rec- it helps us recognize that you don't just have a i learned christology at one point and then i'm done sort of thing well then, 
continuing and, and thing. Thing, The other thing about this, I think is it's important, and this is one thing I think happens often with, well, left behind kind of uh, eschatologies and stuff, yeah. is if you, if you don't do what I suggest, then in fact what ends up happening is actually the significance of the earthly Jesus becomes pretty minimal. I mean, what yeah. you're actually, what becomes interesting or you know, what you look towards, I mean, you have to believe things about that person and that he's going to come again. But in fact, you know, the big excited thing about Jesus is, you know, rapturing people and coming again. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's where the point of interest is. And again, no, that's, that, that's, that's fundamentally a, a mistake. The, the, what's, of, what's of interest, what is ultimate, is what we saw between the birth of the stable and the death on the cross. And everything else that happens afterwards is simply the exaltation of that event. Not so, again, not some further thing that, like, okay, that happened before, but now what we're really looking forward to is something else. No, we're not looking forward to something else. We're looking, we're, we're simply getting, you know, God gives us greater and greater and ultimately more and more public demonstration of that. Because then what we, we end up saying is we end up falling into the privilege, like, quote unquote, the privileging of divinity, right? Like, yeah. well, this and divinity definitely. becomes simply a projection of what we, of power that we like to see rather than what actually has been demonstrated for us. Uh, you know, it's Jesus, you know, bopping heads again, which is what we naturally want to go to when we think of divinity, not the cross, which is what right. God tells us divinity is about. So, yeah. Well, I think after that question might be a good time for our speed round. Okay. So these are, these are quick questions. So just sort of immediate off the cuff. Hmm. Are you a morning or a night person? Um, I think more an afternoon person would be the right. <laughs> what superpower do you wish you could have, and why? Ooh, boy. Um, uh, I think probably invisibility, and I think just because <laughs> I like the idea of sneaking around. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter tells me the smart answer should always be telekinesis but right? just, in terms of gut response that's my response <laughs> but i hesitated because i still have her i think she's logically quite right but you want to just gut response so there you go <laughs> <laughs> if you got a day to hang out with any theologian living or dead who would it be and why hmm. Well, I think it would probably be Bonhoeffer. Um, again, partly, and obviously, he's, there's, you, know, you can make all kinds of way silly. You know, Bonhoeffer had plenty of his own, plenty of problems of, <laughs> in terms of things he thought and everything else. But it was his his um, uh, his own transformations and his sense of engagement with the real world, and you know, particularly his you know going to America and then coming back uh, to, to be in solidarity. Uh, in a time of, you know, where he had to pray for the defeat of his own people, that, you know, that kind of, um, uh, you know, I, I continue to find that incredibly uh, inspiring and, uh, uh, you know, something that I, I, I continue to be challenged by even now, though it's now, you know, 40 years since I first read the, you know, his, his stuff. So I think it would be him. What place in the world have you never can we, been? Can I be clear about that? Just one thing. It's not because I think he's the greatest theologian in the world. Right. It, it, it really has to do with the way in which, for him, uh, theology and and church practice, particularly as somebody, I, I wasn't raised in the church, and he was not really either. I mean, right. formally, but not really. Uh, his family wasn't a religious family. So, you know, there all you know, those sorts of biographical intersections of interesting, you know, things I would be curious to explore. But, I always love asking that question because people interpret it different ways. Because I've had some people interpret it as like, who would be fun to hang out with? And if it, you know, yeah. some people would just be a good time. Like, you know, it depends on who you are. If Luther, well, in that case, it might be Luther as long as I wasn't Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Like, it depends on who you are. <laughs> but, um, and some other people I like deeply respect, but would just not be any fun. Um, yeah, yeah. So, what place in the world have you never been but would love to visit? Um, India. Mm. What is your favorite magical or mythological animal? Ooh. Um, oh, Pegasus. Oh, good one. Yeah. Good one. What's the most significant book in theology in the last 50 years? Uh, I would probably say it was, well, it would be, it would, I think, um, 
for an American, I think it's a book by Cohn. And the question would be, would I say it's black theology and black power just because that was the first or God of the oppressed, which I think is actually the best book. Yeah. Um, so I probably the second. Okay. Um, I still think that's, um, I mean, uh, you know, I've been influenced by lots of other American theologians uh, uh, as well. But I think in terms of a real um, shift of, of, of dialogue and a way of thinking about source materials differently, that for me is still, I would put that at the top. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Fastest speed you've ever driven as a driver or passenger in a car? Yeah, it was as a passenger. Um, it still wasn't really all, I mean, I've heard play a horror story. about 100 miles an hour. What's For a very problem? short distance, I should know. It's still pretty scary. <laughs> right? It there there comes a point where you're like, ooh, 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 and then it's like, <laughs> ooh, stop. <laughs> What's one idea in theology you think needs to die? Ooh. Um, uh, well, I, mean, I think there's, I think there's way overuse of the word incarnation, mm. incarnational stuff. Oh. And I think that's almost always, I mean, incarnation refers to one event <laughs> <laughs> and otherwise use, I mean, you know, again, I think this is where the, the, you know, God's commitment to the world doesn't require, you know, you don't say, well, you know, God's, you know, incarnation is that bit and otherwise, it's okay. I mean, there are plenty of, I need to be to disagree with. Um, so I'm not sure. You know, I could just go through with my, uh, you know, list of, of things I don't like. But that's, I mean, given, <laughs> given we're talking about my, pre my incarnation book, I would encourage all folk out there to be restrictive of your use of the language. If you want to talk about God's dedication to the flourishing of the world, you know, Jews and Muslims can do that just as well as we can. Right. <laughs> you know, we can really add anything as far as that goes. Again, that's built into creation from nothing. Uh, so use incarnation to talk about Jesus and otherwise use, use other language. Nice. So a few more questions. Mm. In your final chapter, you explore this in between Ascension and Parousia space where we find ourselves in and ask a key question. What is the nature of Jesus's presence now? I've noticed that the imperceptibility of Christ tends to be a particular stumbling block for my students. This seeming absence breeds a sense of wistfulness at the distance. Well, if we just met Jesus, you know, the God who was with us and is no longer, the God who was human and is now, well, they're not sure. Part of the lack of theological imagination here is Christological, but it's also linked to our understanding of the Holy Spirit and in the church as the body of Christ. So I'd love to hear you make some sense of of these connections for us and reflect specifically on the relationship between Christ and his body, the church. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, uh, uh, I mean, that, yes, yeah, so I, in the book, I, you know, I talk about sacraments, I talk about the church and then I talk about, um, uh, the way in which uh, then I riff on Maximus for a bit and other things. So the church is indeed uh, a way in which one can speak about Christ's presence. Now I think it's, I think it's, um, not as as in the book. Not the final thing I want to say about it, um, just because it's it it, um, it can be parochial. Uh, but one thing that is, I mean, uh, you know, again, if, since we've talked about Bonhoeffer a bit, you know, Bonhoeffer's idea of Christ existing as the Church, um, it can be overplayed um, uh, in certain respects. That is, one doesn't want to identify generally, <laughs> in, a, in a strong sense, things that happen with the church and what Jesus is doing. Um, I think that really has to be limited to sacramental actions, um, just because otherwise uh, there's a kind of ecclesial triumphalism that can, that can, that can take, take place. I mean, I think what I want to say is that, um, obviously, the Spirit is Jesus' Spirit, um, and the Spirit uh, is not, that Spirit's activity is not limited to the church, but the church is the place where uh, people speak about the Spirit's activity as, as such, and in other places the Spirit can be, certainly be active, but people aren't going to be, by definition, if they're not in the church, they're not going to be talking about it in terms of the Spirit of Jesus in the way that Christians will. So, um, so the church, therefore, has a burden uh, to self-consciously reflect on the extent to which what's happening in it uh, can actually be seen as reflecting what is understood as the Spirit's 
ways with the world. Again, there, there are virtually no places other than, um, you know, absolution, <laughs> baptism, and the Eucharist where I'd want to say church activities can be 100% identified with the activities of the Spirit. But I think there is, and this is part of what the body of Christ is about, there is discernment within the church about, you know, and that's what the church really is all about, is an argument about, you know, what do we do to make, you know, where do we see the Spirit moving and how do we be attentive to those things? So, um, I mean, the fact that Jesus, you know, I mean, uh, people think that Jesus being here would make things easier, just, you know, Plenty of people saw Jesus in the flesh and were truly impressed. So, you know, right. in that sense, the absence or presence is probably you know a moot point. Um, but certainly, uh, at least while Jesus was here, uh, Jesus could control his own self presentation. Uh, at this point, um, obviously, divine sovereignty is such that one trusts Jesus is still doing that in some way. But there's but Jesus is doing it in a way that calls us to be actively involved in it and to take responsibility for it. And so. Um, you know, the activity of the spirit is partly an activity of you know, uh, persons in the church, in faith, and in careful listening and patience with each other, attempting to discern where this is and isn't happening, and attempting to ensure that it's uh, that um, where Jesus uh, Jesus is always seeking to have people share in his life um, what kinds of processes are or are not happening in the church's witness that makes that clear and evident and that creates minimal stumbling blocks for people to be able to, to acknowledge and participate in that. So one last question. I don't really think I'm spoiling the ending here, but I wanted our listeners to hear that this book really is about the gospel um, and what a beautiful gospel it is. So Ian, would you read for us a section uh, near the end of your book for us? Certainly. The message of the gospel is not that of an unknown God, a deus absconditus, who in his transcendence is one with whom we finally can have nothing to do. Whatever combination of awe, terror, respect, or fascination the thought of him may inspire. The gospel is rather that the word, who from all eternity is God, became flesh in and as the human being named Jesus. That this one has a name which by virtue of the incarnation is also an evermore God's name is crucial, for it serves as a continual check on our, tendency, on our tendency to conceive of God in other terms, by reference to whatever ideas of causation, necessity, perfection, order, goodness, truth, or beauty may press upon us in our desire to orient ourselves in the face of the experiences of contingency, vulnerability, suffering, and death that so naturally give rise to talk about God but of a God who, without a name, because beyond any possibility of naming, cannot help but be both unknown and unknowable. Now, it may well be that statements made about this unknown God, the God of the philosophers or of so-called limit experiences, are also true of the God of Israel. Why should it not be so? But however many such statements there may be, this God is not the God of Israel because the God of Israel has a name. The God of Israel is the Lord, and thus not the one beyond all naming, but rather the one with the name that is above every name, and who, as such, takes on a creature's life and a creature's name. That is the mystery. Yet contrary to the etymology of that word, it is not a mystery before which we can only be silent, but one which we are given to know and to speak. It is the mystery that is Jesus, and thus the mystery that the great divide between creature and creator is no barrier to God's becoming intimate with us that the God who is infinite can, without in the least compromising or qualifying or abandoning that infinity, also be finite, that the one who is above can, without ceasing for a moment to be above, also be with, that the one who is eternally begotten can also be born in time, that the one who is omniscient and omnipotent can also be ignorant and weak, that the one who fills all space and time can also be located quite specifically in a stable, a carpenter's shed, or a tomb that the one who is impassable and immortal can also suffer and die. The mystery is not that this one is divine, for that is his eternal nature. It has always been the case. The mystery is that now at the end of all the ages, the one who is and has always been divine has become also fully human, so that we can be children of God and thus fully human too.
Thank you. That, that was just really lovely. Oh, thank you very much. What a, what a beautiful gospel it is. Indeed. For closing us out, what do you hope readers will take away from your book? I hope they'll take away that bit from Luther that is the sort of the superscript for the whole thing, that to understand that the discipline, the Christian discipline of talking about God must always be tied to the humanity of Jesus. And any theology that moves away from that fundamentally ends up compromising what the good news really is. Uh, and so that's what I hope people work with. And that's what I mean. That, that's what I think when I use the phrase Chalcedonian was without reserve. That's what I think Chalcedon actually has the potential to push us to. However, uh, variably it has done so uh, over the history of the last 1,500 years. It was a pleasure talking with you today, Ian. Truly a delight. Well, it's been my, my pleasure to be here, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk a little bit about my work. So this is your host, Amy Hughes, with OnScript. We've been enjoying a conversation today with Dr. Ian McFarlane, Robert W. Woodruff Professor of Theology at Emory University's Candler School of Theology. Ian wrote The Word Make Flesh, A Theology of the Incarnation, published by Westminster John Knox Press. You can find a link to his book on our website, onscript.study. Thank you for joining me today, friends. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study slash donate.